Hello everybody, welcome back to the workshop. So in this video, I'm going to be showing you how to take and make a stacked weld or a billet weld or what they would call an accordion weld or the historical name for it, a faggot weld. So this weld is a pretty common weld and for you guys out there that like to play around with Damascus, this is basically what that weld is. Now this is a little bit of a different type. I think in Damascus work, they call this an accordion weld. Uh, in the knife making realm, uh, but in the blacksmithing realm, obviously it is considered what they call a faggoted weld, something where you pile material up and then weld it down in a bunch or a, bun or a bundle. So the way that we're going to make this weld is we are going to take and notch it and we're going to fold it back on itself. We're going to notch it and we're going to fold it back on itself and then weld up the billet then after that. Now this is just a piece of quarter inch by one inch mild steel bar. So it's nothing fancy. No high carbon steel here. This is just, again, a, just a practice piece. I'm gonna take a bite on it about a one inch, start making out some cubed sections. I'm gonna flip it over a full 180 degrees and hammer it there on the other side, the opposite side. And then again, 180 degrees. So it's on that side. So we're going to flip it over 180 degrees again. And we're just going to put a notch in there. That is to take and help bend it where we need it. So we'll go ahead and heat this up one more time. This welding demonstration is going to go very quickly. So. In other welding videos where I've been talking about the different welds, ring welds, lap welds, um, <laughs> flat ring welds, T welds, L welds, glut welds, um, butted welded joints, things like that, we have not gotten into a case where we need to use flux except to blend in the toe of a scarf. So with that being said, now is the time to take and talk about flux a little bit more in depth, that it's okay to go ahead and use flux for this weld. And the reason for that being is the surface area. If you have a lot of material, although I don't believe we need it for this small stock, but if you have a lot of material, you may want to go ahead and get yourself some flux and just sprinkle it on the end grain of the piece and let it wick through. You do not have to drown it in it. It doesn't prevent oxygen from hitting the steel. It's not a caramelized coating. It's not a glue. It's a flux. It eats the scale and it takes and pulls that scale away from the molten surfaces of the material. It takes that scale to the top so it can be transferred off. It can be blown out from between the joint. The scale can go out from between the joint. Again, it is to flux the steel, it is not to glue the steel together, so do not use a bunch of it if you are going to flux the piece. So now we're going to bend away from the notches that we've made on every occurrence here. We're going to go ahead and bend away from the other notch. And we're going to start working like a Z here, and we're going to bend away from that final notch. And I'm going to heat this up one more time so this way we can get that fully flopped over there. As you can see, making those little notch cuts really do help with making those bins exactly where we want it at roughly one inch or 25 mil square cubed, if you will. So this will work out pretty well. When you're making your notches in to do something like this, say you're working with a really thick piece of stock, say a one inch piece of bar stock, you need to take and sever most of the way through to where maybe you've got about a quarter inch to three eighths an inch of material or six mil to nine mil of material of that one inch or 25 mil bar square left in order to make that bend. So just be aware of that, it does take you have to do cut down quite a bit. You can't just notch it just a little bit and then bend it. Uh, you're just creating a stress riser and you're probably gonna get a crack there. That's not gonna be good. You're gonna get a lot of cracking on that outside bend. So we don't want that. So I'm gonna get this hot one more time here, hot enough to bend it that last little go. And then 
I probably won't even, fl I'll, pr I'll flux it just so you can see the miracle of flux and you can see, <laughs> see the amount that I actually use here on the actual piece. So again, we we're trying to bend that over in that last heat. I'm gonna try to bend it back on itself. It's not gonna wanna do that, obviously. Okay, so now that stack is all welded up or all piled up there. And you'll see that it's starting to get some surface scale on there. That is because of the oxygen interacting with the steel. So it's gonna do that at any heat that is above a cherry red in temperature, it's gonna scale. But since we're gonna flux it, we'll go ahead and brush it up just a bit. And now watch, I'm taking a pinch of material, pinch of flux, and I'm sprinkling it on the zigzag edge. That's it. That flux there, that pinch of flux, will run down through this entire piece. So we're gonna set it back in the fire like this so the flux can draw all the way through the piece. Then we'll turn it like this and then like that to bring the whole mass up to a welding heat. Once it's all up to a welding heat, we'll bring it out and weld it on the anvil. We'll set it in there. Get this good and hot, and here we go. So if you've made it this far in the video, I wanna thank you for watching this video and joining us here at Christ Centered Ironworks. All of my longtime supporters and sponsors of this channel, uh, that's you, the viewer, all my longtime subscribers, you all are awesome, and I thank you so much for uh, watching me and taking the time to watch me without within the compounds of your very busy schedules and very busy days. I greatly appreciate that. If you're new here and you would like to take and support what Jessica and I do here at Christ Center Ironworks after you watch some of the nearly 1,200 videos here that we have on YouTube for tutorials and teaching, if you want to take and help support that in the future, a great way of doing that is just to take and share this video around with your friends if you found it helpful or inspirational. And as always, if you want to take and support us here financially at Christ Center Ironworks, a great way of doing that is going over and checking out our website at blacksmithpdfs.com. Um, that's a great way of doing that and we greatly appreciate your patronage over there as well. All right, so I'm gonna switch tongs here a little bit. We're getting pretty close to heat. Once we're getting up here, we wanna, once we get closer and closer to our welding heat, we wanna start moving this piece around so this way we can get heat on all sides of this equal. Remember, this isn't a solid mass yet, so one side can burn where the other side won't even be hot enough to weld yet. So. Give this a good long soak time. And get a second. Remember, if you can see your steel, oxygen can see your steel. So you don't want to you don't want to be able to see your material. And the hotter the firebox becomes, the less air you want to take and put into it to keep it that way. This will allow it to come up to a very nice even temperature for forge welding. So I'll talk real briefly just before we pull this out because it's almost, it's almost there. It's so close right now. The reason why I, I talk about flux, you're not needing flux for a lot of welds, is because if you have the right conditions in your fire for a good clean weld, you will not need the flux. And too much flux, as I have done in the past, I used to just roll my piece around in the flux. I had a big bucket of it, and I mean, I would go through, you know, three boxes of 20 mule team borax a month, you know, so I was an over fluxer, and, it, and I could never get really any good results with my welds, nothing that would stay and stick. So that's why I say you don't need it all the time, but there is specific occurrences where you do need it and that's where metal or scale could potentially get trapped underneath the welded surface and not be able to be expelled with your hammer blows. All right, 
This piece is nearly all the way there. It's basically there. We're gonna come out for the weld. You're gonna have your hammer ready. You need to have it on the anvil, but if you're not experienced enough or quick enough, have it in your hand ready to go. So I'm gonna come out with this piece and I'm gonna reheat it right back up. So you don't wanna take and go to town on this too much. You wanna just be able to hit it hard enough that you can compress and get rid of that scale in that flux. That's the big important thing. If you use flux on a joint like that, and then you just baby tap around on it, you're gonna trap that flux between the joints. So you gotta give it a quick snap blow to blow out that flux, and then you can baby tap around on it to set the joint. Um, the problem with that is, is if you hit it too hard, you can actually blow out the weld material as well. And if you want to know whether you're doing that or not, a great way of telling is you'll actually have little metal, they look like little metal icicles where they've been like, psh, like spread out like that. I'm not quite sure what to compare them to. Uh, if you've ever seen lead get melted and it just kind of drops and hits like a cold surface and it instantly splashes and freezes, it looks like that. And you'll find those laying around your anvil. It's not scale, it's like a piece of what was liquid hot metal, but it kind of looks like an icicle. That's what that was. That was that molten metal getting squirted out the sides. We don't want that. Also, you'll notice that this thing wasn't at a bright sparkling heat all crazy light. It was at a correct welding heat without any excess oxygen. It is the oxygen in the fire or in the atmosphere that you bring out that causes all the burning in that firecracker look or that white sparkling heat. So if you get too much oxygen in your fire, when you pull your piece out, it'll already be sparkling. If your fire is correct, you'll pull the piece out and then it'll start to sparkle. That's how you can tell real quick that you actually have a good neutral, oxygen neutral fire. So that's basically welded in. I'm gonna take one more heat on it there and we're gonna draw that mass out a bit more just so you can kind of see what usefulness this can have for you. So most people would think of this as a knife making thing or would be good for knives, um, doing things like that. But what its original purpose was, was to build up mass when you didn't have any. Uh, that was its main purpose originally, was to take and build up extra mass in a piece of bar stock when only you had maybe a wagon tire to work with, or you just had thin shreds of material, but you needed to take and have something for like, I don't know, a door stop, a door knocker. You needed extra mass on the end of a loop that you were gonna build like a big hoop, hoop or something and you, it wasn't overly convenient to upset the piece a lot. So it was really easy, especially in wrought iron, to just go whack, fold, whack, fold, and get that mass built up on the piece and weld it all up. Case in point, you might see this on a lot of larger or smaller wrought iron anvils. You'll see a little bit of a zigzag line. You can see that from time to time on really old examples where they had a flat sheet, they bent it all up, and then welded it as they went there and uh, until they build up enough mass into the piece. Because as you can imagine, it was probably hard for them to find something that was exactly the size chunk they needed for the anvil. So I'm gonna draw the one end down into a bit of a point, just so you guys can see that. And that could be a very handy end for like I said, a door stop or something like that, a piece to a gate, latch system, a lot of different things it could be.
So instead you have to draw this down out of a thick piece of bar stock. You could just stack weld it like this. And you would be good to go. So you can see something like that that could be hooked on to something. Again, that might become a decorative finial or a stop. Again, a door stop, a gate latch piece. Sky's the limit on that. But you can see that would be a real pain to take and forge out of a lot thicker material. All we had to do was stack up the material and go like that. Again, it's just all about putting mass uh, where you need it and being able to forge weld good enough to do so. So that's it for today. That's where I'm going to end the video. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any more questions about forge welding or anything that I've went over here today, drop them for me down in the comment section down below. As always, I'd love to hear from you. So without further ado, God bless you, and we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching.